Hello everybody and welcome back to Microbiology. Today we'll be covering Chapter 15, Microbial Mechanisms of Pathogenicity. First, let's outline a few definitions. The first is pathogenicity, which is the ability of a microbe to cause disease by overcoming the host's defenses. Next is disease itself, which is any condition in which the normal structure or functions of the body are damaged or impaired. And then finally, virulence, which can sometimes be confused with pathogenicity, but it is the degree to which an organism is pathogenic. So if we were, were to apply these terms to the chapter heading, microbial mechanisms of pathogenicity, we're studying how microbes overcome our defenses and cause disease. So coronavirus could have pathogenicity in humans, while uh, lactobacillus acidophilus, which is used to culture yogurt, would not. We can also use an example for virulence, where Ebola virus has a high virulence, while Candida albicans has a low virulence. Checkpoint one, describe in your own words the difference between pathogenicity and virulence. Don't just state the chapter definitions, but I want you to state these in your own words, please. or viruses or other eukaryotes, of course, that actually um, infect the tissues that are involved with these outside services, then we are talking about actually entering the host. So after entering the host, it must invade and then infect the host. And we'll talk about the difference in step one and step two. And then finally, step three, it has to exit the host, obviously, in order to infect another organism. Otherwise, it's not infectious and spreadable. Okay, so let's cover step one, how uh, they may enter the host. And we'll first talk about portals of entry. The first portal of entry we'll discuss are mucous membranes which are mucus secreting tissues that line various body systems, including the respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract, the genitourinary tract, and conjunctiva. For those of you not aware, conjunctiva are the uh, mucous membranes associated with the eye. Next is the skin. Uh, the skin has natural openings, which have hair follicles that have uh, sweat glands and sebaceous glands. And you can have a portal of entry by penetration of the skin itself, or uh, you can have it through the parenteral route. And we're going to go by what the textbook defines this as, not what other definitions you might find on the internet. So make sure you're watching these lectures to get uh, specific definitions that we have for this class. And the parenteral route is defined as breaches of the skin or mucous membranes. Essentially what that means is wounds. Uh, if you have a cut on your skin or a tear in your, uh, uh, some sort of a membrane or something like that, that would be considered the parenteral route. Now, something important to keep in mind is that each pathogen has its own preferred portal of entry at which it can cause diseases. So um, through other portals of entry, the same microbes can actually be harmless. Examples of this are Streptococcus pneumoniae, which can cause disease of the respiratory tract, but not of the gastrointestinal tract and E. coli, which can cause disease of the genitourinary tract, but usually, I say usually, not of the gastrointestinal tract. Checkpoint two, describe the three main portals of entry discussed in this chapter.
Whatever the portal of entry, a microbe must have some way to remain attached to the host. So we need something called adhesion and microbes adhere to the host at the portal of entry using special surface molecules called adhesins. Here we can see an example of adhesins in the bacterial cell wall. And what adhesins are specified to bind to are called the adhesin receptors. Here we can see on the host cell membrane, there are adhesin receptors. Now these adhesin receptors aren't built to bind bacterial cell walls. It's the opposite way, opposite way around. Bacterial cell walls have evolved to have adhesins that can bind to molecular markers on the outside of the host cell membrane. Checkpoint three. Clostridium tetani, the pathogen that causes tetanus, can only enter the body through deep wounds. How would we describe its preferred portal of entry? Okay, step two, invasion and infection of the host. Different classes of microbes possess different virulence factors. Um, those are um, factors that allow microbes to avoid being targeted by the host immune system and carry out a successful infection. We're going to cover three groups, the bacteria, viruses, and eukaryotic pathogens, and what types of virulence factors they possess. The first, bacteria. So bacteria have capsules. Um, which, as you recall, is a rigid glycocalyx. And they are partially protective and that they prevent destruction uh, via phagocytosis, which means to essentially consume or eat cells. Um, so these capsules uh, kind of help protect them from being digestible. So for example, only the encapsulated form of streptococci pneumonia can, pre can actually cause pneumonia. Sorry, that is, I mispronounced that. That's streptococci pneumoniae. Next, we also have the sticky glycocalyx, which we've defined before. That's the slime layer. And this slime layer allows bacteria to attach and exist in biofilms. And these biofilms can also help protect them from phagocytosis. An example of this is Staphylococcus epidermis, which is the most common cause of inf infections in indwelling catheters due to its ability to form a biofilm on the device. Now we have some specific bacterial cell wall components to cover. So the cell walls and extracellular appendages of some species are composed of materials that resist host defenses. Examples of these include uh, S. pyogenes, which has a cell wall in fimbriae and contain heat and acid resistant M protein. Then we have the outer layer of mycobacteria which is composed of phagocytosis resistant mycolic acids. If you recall, that's their acid fast uh, cell wall component. And now we have bacterial exozymes. So bacterial exoenzymes are special enzymes that are produced by bacteria that increase their virulence. This includes coagulase, which as the name sort of implies, clots blood. And this blood clotting can actually shield and protect some bacteria from phagocytosis. Next is collagenase, which breaks down collagen and allows the bacteria to spread throughout tissue. And uh, finally, we have here phospholipase C, which allows bacillus anthracis to break out of the phagosome, which is essentially a uh, organelle that um, destroys bacteria and pathogens. So it allows them to break free of that before they are destroyed. A 
final example of a bacterial exoenzyme is the enzyme hyaluronidase, which attacks hyaluronin, which is an important component of some of the body's connective tissues. And here we can see using this hyaluronidase, it can break down connective tissues and increase spreading of the bacteria. Now we have another uh, type of um, compound created by bacteria. These are bacterial toxins, which are biological poisons that increase virulence by allowing pathogens to invade their host and cause damage. We have two types the endotoxins and the exotoxins. The endotoxins are compounds found in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, and they are released when cells divide or die, and these can produce general inflammation. Now we have the exotoxins, which are compounds that are produced mostly by gram-positive bacteria and they are produced as a part of their metabolism and they produce a specific damage to host cells. Something that can be quite confusing to students is that uh, compounds that are found on the outside or the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria are endotoxins. Endo means you know inside or in. So um, the big difference here is that these exotoxins are being released and the endotoxins are just part of the cell. I have four exotoxins that you should be aware of. The first is cholera toxin. Uh, naturally, it's easy to remember that it comes from Vibrio cholera, cholerae, and this causes secretion of fluids and electrolytes from cells. Uh, next, we have tetanus toxin, and this naturally comes from Clostridium tetani, and this inhibits neurotransmitters and causes paralysis. Next is phospholipase C from Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which disrupts cell membranes by destroying phospholipids. And finally is streptolysin from Streptococcus pneumoniae. And this disrupts cell membranes by creating pores. Checkpoint four, Neisseria meningitis is a gram-negative species and the most common cause of bacterial meningitis in adults. Its toxin, known as lipooligosaccharide, is part of the outer cell membrane. Is this an endotoxin or exotoxin? This slide is a little messy, but what I'm trying to convey to you is the lipid A part of the LPS layer in gram-negative bacteria. This component of the uh, bacterium cell wall is an endotoxin. And if you recall, with gram-negative bacteria, you have an inner membrane, a peptidoglycan layer in the periplasm, and an outer membrane and attached to this outer membrane is the lipopolysaccharide. And there is a component called lipid A that is part of this lipopolysaccharide right here. And this can actually cause an inflammatory response in humans. Uh, so therefore it is an endotoxin. So this lipid A is released both when gram-negative bacteria die or as they divide, these particles can get um, released. Uh, it is not destroyed by heating or cooking. And therefore, uh, if these bacteria grow in, in food, um, even after cooking, you can still get sick if the microbial load is high enough. So as we discussed, this causes inflammation and it can lead to a drop in blood pressure and multi-organ failure and death if the concentrations are high. The LD50 is 0.24 milligrams per kilogram. What that means is that means the lethal dose 
for 50% of the population is 0.24 milligrams of LPS or lipid A for every kilogram of body weight. Now let's talk some about viral virulence factors. You can see in this image that the HIV, um, HIV is attaching to T lymphocytes, which is a type of cell in the human body. And it does so through the use of adhesins. Um, so we've already sort of talked about adhesins, but they allow the uh, pathogen to interact with the receptor of that adhesin, which, is, which will be present on the host cells and allows them to, to attach and then therefore enter the cell. Pathogens often have to change uh, their um, outside markers. Uh, the immune system uh, identifies a pathogen based upon what's on the outside of the cell or on the outside of the virus or the infectious agent. And so if the pathogen can slightly change these chemical markers by altering the structure, the shape, the chemical makeup of them, they can disguise themselves from the immune system. And this would also include these adhesins. Different pathogens can use this strategy um, all the way from the bacterium Neisseria gonorrhoeae, the virus HIV, and the eukaryotic Giardia lamblia. In influenza viruses, this is particularly important because it forces us to develop new flu vaccines every year as new antigenic variations emerge or to retrain our immune systems. We can see how this plays out on the next slide here. With, uh, if we look at this slide on the x-axis is time and on the y-axis is the type of antigen present. So we can imagine maybe with a flu virus that these are different seasons. So in one flu season, we have the first variant emerge, variant one, which has an outer marker that is, maybe it's an adhesion, and it's sort of this uh, square shape. And uh, this blooms into being taking up a high percentage of the uh, flu population. But eventually the immune system develops a, uh, a, uh, a, a identification marker for that. And so it can be on the decline. Um, and as it declines though, a new variant may emerge through mutational uh, changes in this particular cell marker. And so a variant two might emerge, which has a different shape that's more like a triangle. And so the immune system has to develop a new way to identify that. So it creates this new uh, um, receptor. They can find and locate these, this new antigen, and so on and so forth. So these uh, markers, which elicit an immune response, are called antigens. In this image, you'll see two different mechanisms. You'll see the antigenic, antigenic drift, which happens here on the left side of the image, and the antigenic shift, which happens on the right side of this image. Antigenic drift is more of a gradual change where natural mutations occur over time that lead to uh, minor alterations of a outer surface mark. So here we have, in a virus, we have neuraminidase and hemagglutinin. And over time, this hemagglutinin changes its shape. Uh, as we can see over here, here's a mutated version. So this new strain emerges. And this virus A then becomes, we're just calling it virus B here. Antigenic shift is much different. Um, antigenic shift is the process by which two or sometimes even more different strains of viruses can combine to make a new subtype, which has a mixture of the two surface antigens of the two or more original strains. In this example, we're just using two, virus A and virus B. You can imagine that maybe both of these viruses infect a host cell at the same time. And during the process of creating a new virion, 
the uh, nucleic acids from both of these organisms get mixed up, or both of these infectious agents get mixed up and create one which has a mixture of uh, virus A's nucleic acids and virus B's nucleic acids, some of which may code for different neuraminidases or he hemagglutinins. So here we have a combination of a hemagglutinin from virus B and a neuraminidase from virus A. And that's what we call antigenic shift. So this slide uh, summarizes those two different processes. Again, the antigenic drift results from small genetic changes over time, like the seasonal flu. Antigenic shift occurs when two different viruses infect the same host cell and get assembled with new genes. An example of this was the 2009 H1N1 influenza, which combined uh, hemagglutinin 1 and neuraminidase 1 from two different viruses into one uh, flu virus. Okay, briefly, uh, fungal vir uh, virulence factors include biofilm production, uh, capsules, there's a virus called cryptococcus, which produces a protective capsule that resists phagocytosis. And then we have something called mycotoxins. Remember that myco means fungi, so fungal, fungal toxins. We have the claviceps purpurea, which produces the hallucinogen in ergot, uh, which is lysergenic, lysergic acid. And we have aspergillus flavus, which produces the potentially mutagenic aflatoxin. So this can actually cause your DNA or your nucleic acids to mutate. So essentially they're changing the code in the sequence of your DNA. Briefly, protozoan virulence factors. Uh, so these are you know, eukaryotes. Um, we have antigenic variation. We have the plasmodium fal falciparum, which causes malaria can have changes in important antigens over time. So therefore, you cannot develop a full immunity to malaria. We have special attachment mechanisms. In Giardia lamblia, they can use an adhesive disc to attach to the intestinal epithelial cells. Then we have capsules. So. Trypanosome brucei, which causes African sleeping sickness, can produce capsules that protect itself from phagocytosis. Finally, we have step three, exiting the host. Pathogens have to leave the body through specific portals. The respiratory and GI tract are the most common portals to leave. Respiratory tract can include coughing and sneezing. And uh, one thing that we should keep in mind then is that we should try and protect others from this by uh, covering ourselves when we cough and sneeze. It's best not to use your hands when doing this, rather use the sleeve or the inside of your shirt if you can, or some other uh, source that you're not going to be then using to spread around. And Next here is the gastrointestinal tract. So this could be feces or saliva. The geneto, genito urinary tract. So this could be um, you know, the genital system or the urinary system. And number four, skin or wound drainage. Let's do another vocabulary check here. We have Two distinct uh, um, things that we need to be aware of uh, that sound similar but are quite different indeed, and that is signs. Disease signs are things that are measurable and observable by a healthcare worker. The, this could be vital signs. Um, symptoms, though, are subjective. So this is how a patient might say they feel about something. For example, their nausea or fatigue. For checkpoint five, I want you to provide an example of a specific sign or symptom not listed in the PowerPoint and what makes it one or the other.
One of the last things we'll cover in this chapter are the periods of disease. If you look at this graph, on the x-axis we have time over the course of an infection. On the y-axis we have two different things we're plotting. In the red line we're plotting the number of pathogen particles present in the body. On the blue line we're plotting the we're graphing the severity of symptoms. Usually the symptoms are going to be lagging behind whatever's occurring with a number of pathogens because it's sort of reactionary to the pathogens. So in the incubation period, you're seeing the pathogens starting to replicate in the body, but we don't yet have any symptoms uh, occurring. During the prodromal period, the pathogens are replicating more, replicating more rapidly, and we suddenly have the appearance of symptoms and then during the period of illness, we still have this continuation of a rapid increase in pathogen numbers and a rapid increase in the severity of symptoms. Eventually though, uh, the pathogen starts to decline in numbers and uh, pretty closely tracking is the decline in the severity of symptoms. And then finally, what we call the period of, of convalescence, which is uh, where all of the symptoms uh, subside and all of or mostly all of the uh, pathogen uh, disappears from the body. Okay, so let's cover these individually. We have the incubation period where the pathogen enters the host, begins multiplying, and again, there are no signs or symptoms of disease yet. The length of incubation period can be highly variable for some diseases, such as rabies, which is a very rapid onset. Um, next is the prodromal period, and this is where the patient begins to feel symptoms. Now we have the period of illness where signs and symptoms are most severe and the number of pathogens are greatest. This is followed by the period of decline where the pathogen numbers and signs and symptoms decline. Secondary infections due to opportunistic pathogens may begin here. And finally, we have the period of convalescence where the patient recovers, but some diseases leave permanent damage. So an example of this could be heart murmurs following scarlet fever. Now it depends on the pathogen, but a patient may be contagious during all five periods of disease. An example is the Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, which sheds in the saliva for months following recovery from mononucleosis. So no microbiology chapter discussing uh, microbial methogens of pathogenicity would be complete without discussing Robert Koch's postulates. If you recall back to chapter one, we discussed the germ theory of disease and Robert Koch's role in the germ theory of disease. And uh, he developed what, he, what were called uh, Koch's postulates. There's four of them, and this determines uh, the causative agent of a infectious disease. The first of which being that the suspected pathogen must be present in every case of disease and not found in healthy individuals. The second is the suspected pathogen can be isolated and grown in pure culture. If you can't grow it in pure culture, then there could be something else in there that is responsible for causing the disease. The healthy test subject inoculated with the suspected pathogen must develop the same signs and symptoms of the disease. And number four, path the pathogen must be re-isolated from the new host and shown to be identical to the pathogen in postulate two. Now, this is a, a very robust system for examining if a pathogen causes a disease However, it's not always a possible way to explore um, a disease. First of all, in the first um, postulate, some people are asymptomatic carriers. So it might be that you can find this pathogen in healthy individuals. Second of all, 
not all pathogens are uh, culturable in the lab. If you recall, uh, about 99.99% of pathogens we cannot grow in the lab. As many of these pathogens can be fastidious organisms, they can be very difficult to grow in the lab. Third, uh, um, if you in inoculate a healthy test subject, they may not be susceptible to the disease. For example, they might have a immunity to that disease, and so they simply are resistant, and so they don't develop the signs and symptoms of the disease. So as you can see, there are many holes in why this can't be used for every infectious disease. However, if you can accomplish all four of these, it is uh, a pretty solid uh, um, demonstration that that particular pathogen is the causative agent for a particular disease. This figure shows how a Koch's postulates play out. Um, we have two different mice. We have a, a healthy mouse and we have a diseased mouse. And in the healthy mouse, there are no causative agents present in its blood. And therefore, we cannot isolate the causative agent. In the diseased mouse, the suspected agent is identified. And here we have a streak plate that is done in order to find individual colonies of this, uh, of this organism that's causing this disease. And so those colonies can be isolated and made into a pure culture. So this passes step one and it being present in the disease organisms and step two in that we can isolate it from that diseased organism. Now step three is after we've cultured it purely, uh, we are going to reintroduce it into a healthy organism and the healthy organism must become disease. And so it passes uh, postulate three. And finally, we must re-isolate it from that diseased uh, organism. This slide I added here at the end compares infectious doses versus lethal doses. Uh, which is a way of comparing virulence. The ID 50 is the infectious dose of 50% of the population. So just because you're exposed to one cell or one virus or one infectious agent does not mean that you're going to come down with a disease that it might cause. So the infectious dose Necessary to cause 50% of the animals to be infected is the ID50. The LD50 is a little more intense than that. This is the lethal dose of 50% of the population. This is the number of cells or viruses or infectious agents, or it could even be the amount of toxin necessary in order to kill 50% of the animals that are tested with it. So, what does this mean? This means that the lower val relative values means that these, uh, these viruses, cells, toxins, uh, etc., are less infective and less lethal. And relatively higher levels means that they are more effective and more lethal. Therefore, they have a higher degree of virulence. So an example would be the infectious dose 50 for norovirus which uh, is often seen on cruise lines and things like that. It's spread through the oral fecal route, can cause disease or infection with as little as one to 10 viral particles. However, for the infectious dose 50 of E. coli, uh, you need roughly 10 million to 10 billion cells. Well, that's all we have for today. Thank you for joining me and I hope you listen next time. Take care. Bye-bye.